Right, so we're looking at the A2 physics paper from Edexcel, and it's uh, Unit 4 Physics on the Move from January 2012. Right, let's get started. Question 1. The momentum of a particle is P, and the kinetic energy of the particle is then doubled. The momentum is now what? Okay, so it's important to remember here that momentum is proportional to velocity. If it's the same particle, mass isn't changing. So momentum is proportional to velocity. Kinetic energy is proportional to velocity squared. So if we imagine that the original velocity was v1 and the new velocity is v2, we can write a relationship between the two kinetic energies because the new kinetic energy is twice the old kinetic energy. So we can say that a half m v2 squared is two times a half m v1 squared. Now you quickly realize that a half m can be taken out of both of those equations and that means that v2 squared equals 2 v1 squared. So to get the relationship between the v's we need to take the square root of both sides and we get that v2 is going to be root 2 times v1. And that's going to give us the relationship between the momentums, because if we multiply both of those by m now, we'll find that the second momentum is root 2 times the first momentum. Which means this is the answer. Question 2. The diagram represents the collision between two subatomic particles P and Q moving with momenta 1 and 2 respectively. After the collision they have momenta 3 and 4. So we've got on the left hand side some before momentum values then they hit each other and come apart with these after momentum values. Which vector diagram best describes or best shows sorry, the correct relationship between the momenta of P and Q? Well, remember, the conservation momentum is, is the, the total momentum before the interaction equals the total momentum after the interaction. So the total momentum of 4 is going to be the sum of these two, and the total momentum after is going to be the sum of these two. And so we want to look and see 1 and 2 being added, and that's not happening here, it's not happening here. 1 and 2 are being added here as a, a vector diagram, and it's actually showing that the 3 and 4 added have the same overall resultant, that the sum of 1 and 2 has the same size as the sum of 3 and 4. So this is the correct answer. Question 3. A student is sitting on the right-hand side of a bus facing the direction of travel. The bus goes round a bend to the left. The student remains in the same position within the bus. The student experiences a force to the left and a force to the right, a resultant force to the left, a resultant force to the right, no resultant force. Well, the important thing here is the direction of travel of the bus. The bus is turning, sorry, the bus is turning, according to this, to the left. Okay, so we can imagine that the bus is heading in this kind of direction and remember that the curvature will require a force initially at least on everything in the bus to make it follow that path it will need an initial push in the same direction as the bus is turning so in order for the student to follow the bus the bus will through the seat and uh, possibly the um, frame of the side of the bus push the student towards the left to make them follow the path of the bus. And so the correct answer is going to be B. They need to get nudged to the left so that they will turn to the left with the bus. Question 4 is just straight book work. The unit of flux linkage, linkage here is one of these and flux linkage is just Weber so that's a nice straight recognizing the term from 
your notes. Question 5. An electric motor is connected via a switch to a battery. A graph is plotted to show the variation of current I with time T. The switch is closed at time T. Which of the following graphs is correct? This question is recognizing the fact that uh, once the motor spins, it will have a dynamo effect. So if, for example, we just turned the circuit on and didn't let the motor spin, then we would get constant current. Uh, but what will happen as the motor spins is that the current will fall. So it can't be this one. It's not going to be that one. It's going to be one of these two. Now if current fell to zero, the motor wouldn't turn. So current must fall back to some set, set value. Um, and so the best guess answer here would be this one. Question 6. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. An atom of deuterium has, and you've just got to recognize um, from the nomenclature, the naming system here, we have a nucleon number of 2 and an atomic number of 1. An atomic number tells you um, that it has to be called hydrogen, but it also tells you that it must have one proton. So we're only looking at the lines here that have one proton. And we're looking for a total nucleon count of two, which means it has to have a total of uh, protons and neutrons adding up to two. So there's only one line that has one proton and also one neutron, and that's B. So B is our correct answer. Question 7. The rest mass of a proton is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. This mass in MeV over C squared is approximately one of these values. So representing uh, masses in an energy units over C squared is a common thing in particle physics. Uh, to convert this to joules, we would multiply, bring the C squared across, multiply by it. Um, and then to convert to electron volts, we would need to divide by the electron charge. So we would need to multiply this value by c squared. That will give us an answer in joules. And then we convert the joules to electron volts by dividing by the electron charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So we get 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 times uh, the speed of light squared divided by the electron charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. That's our conversion to EV. The top line is joules. By dividing by E, we get it in EV. So you can see we get 939 million, which means that we're MEVs 940, and D is our answer. Okay, question 8 then. A positive kion or K plus uh, meson uh, it includes a strange quark. Its structure could be one of these. Well, the first thing to remember is that mesons are quark-antiquark -quark pairs. They, all, they always come as quark-antiquark -quark pairs. So that sort of uh, rules out these two because they're triplets. Um, secondly, this one doesn't have an antiquark. So um, it's important to recognize then that um, the only possible answer here is A. Sorry for circling B. Didn't mean to do that. Okay, so A is the only one that's quark antiquark. So the minute they say meson, we're looking for something that's Q, Q bar. And there's only one that has that property. Okay, so the K plus is likely to decay to one of these. Um, so we need to look at the properties that it conserves. Uh, we'd like to think that it, it uh, will conserve charge. Um, so we're looking for something that will be positive overall. Um, the A doesn't conserve charge because that gives you a neutral overall. Uh, B conserves charge because um, it does have a positive. Uh, C doesn't conserve charge because you've got plus and minus giving you zero again. And D doesn't conserve charge because you've got zero and negative giving you overall negative. 
So there's only one here that conserves charge, and that is B. This is the only thing that gives a positive overall. Question 10. The de Broglie wavelength of a moving tennis ball is calculated as 1 times 10 to the minus three, 33 sorry, of a metre. This means that the moving tennis ball, A, diffracts through a narrow slit, B, does not behave as a particle, C, does not display wave properties, D, is travelling at the speed of light. Does not display wave properties. It's impossible for us to generate a slit um, that is similar in size to this wavelength. That's when you get diffractions. A slit that small, the tennis ball obviously could not travel through. So it, it's impossible for the tennis ball to go through a slit that would give its wave properties any kind of meaning because the slit would be smaller than the ball and the ball wouldn't go through the slit. Um, and this is one of these sort of uh, contradictions. It does have this property, but we can never observe it because the slit would have to be so small that obviously the ball wouldn't go through it. It's also extremely small. You know, this is... A, gaps in matter smaller than the nucleus of an atom so it's not going to display wave properties that's really what's going on here question 11 a explain what is meant by a uniform electric field so what we're going to be saying here is the properties of an electric field and then the properties of a uniform electric field so electric field is a zone where a charged particle would experience a force and a uniform electric field tells us that the force on the charged particle would be the same in all uh, positions in the zone. That's really what you need to explain. So we've got a force on a charged particle, is what an electric field does. Um, and a uniform one, ha the, the force has the same value in all positions within that zone. So a region of space where a charged particle experiences the same force at all points within that region. Part B then. Describe how a uniform electric field can be demonstrated in, in a laboratory. Well, that's your standard um, little electric fields demo where you get like a big petri dish and you put in some like castor oil and you add to that some electrodes sitting parallel to each other and you put across that some kind of high voltage um, so we've got castor oil that just provides a medium and then you sprinkle in semolina seeds and they're polarized and they will start to line up pretty much like iron filings do you'll start to get a lot of patterns emerging across the gap here nice straight lines so you need to explain that petri dish castor oil sprinkle in semolina seeds put two electrodes in with a high voltage across them and they will start to the seeds will start to line up a bit like the way iron filings do for magnets. Question 12. In 1820, Hans Ørsted uh, did an experiment with an electric current in a wire. He noticed that whenever the current was on, it affected a compass needle lying near the wire. A few years later, André Ampère observed that two parallel wires attract each other if they are carrying current in the same direction. Explain André Ampère's observation, you may add to the diagram. Well, Orsted is basically figuring out there that uh, a wire carrying current produces a magnetic field. So we need to demonstrate what this looks like from the point of view of these two wires. So... I've drawn using the flights of the arrow convention current uh, in the two wires an end view of those from uh, looking like from this end and uh, wire one currents heading away from us wire two currents heading away from us and our right hand grip rule for that gives us that wire one produces 
clockwise magnetic field so that its field in the zone around wire 2 is going to be a downward thing and then we can use our left hand rule with current going straight into the page and magnetic field pointing straight down to work out what is happening with the force. If I do that with my left hand with current uh, being the red here pointing straight down sorry magnetic field being the red pointing straight down uh, cur current pointing away from us so your second finger has to be pointing into the page your first finger of your left hand has to be pointing straight down in this direction and what we find is that when you're in that position with your left hand with current second finger pointing straight into the page and a pointy finger pointing straight down like this we get a picture of force being this way so and it wouldn't matter if you swapped and drew the field belonging to wire 2 and wire 1 in it we would get the same behavior okay so left hand rule tells us that wire 2 will be pulled towards wire 1 and that's what you need to explain so you draw the field belonging to one of them you put the other one in it and do a left hand rule check of what the direction of force is and you'll find that they're always towards each other so you need to explain that wire 2 is in the field of wire 1 uh, wire 1 produces a magnetic field that's what this experiment was telling us about wire 2 is in that magnetic field we know the direction from the right hand grip rule gives us this idea of it being down at this point we know that this current is flowing away from us and when we apply the left hand rule then to that we get a force pointing this way towards the other wire which is why they attract. Question 13. At the beginning of the last century experiments were performed using alpha particles and gold foil. The alpha particles were directed at the gold foil and a detector was used to see if and where they were scattered. Summarize the results from these experiments and the conclusions that were drawn from them. So the first thing to note about the Rutherford experiment here is that most of the alpha particles go straight through, which means that whatever is in there, it's very tiny, and most of the atom has uh, no occupied space, so most of the atom consists of em empty space. So a tiny amount were deflected uh, by small angles, and an extremely tiny amount were deflected by very large angles and this is telling us that there is a concentration of charge and also that there is a mass which is greater than the alpha particles mass in order for a particle to ping back from something it has to be hitting something that's uh, more massive than itself so we've got a concentration of charge and we've got a concentration of mass so basically all the mass and charge is in a tiny object at the center of the atom and that's where we get the idea of the nucleus so mostly empty space tells us that you know the nucleus is extremely small compared to the space taken up by the atom uh, and we've got a concentration of charge and we've got a concentration of mass something more massive than the alpha particle in order for it to ping backwards like this you can only go backwards if you hit an object bigger than yourself. Question 14. The photo photograph shows uh, tracks in a particle detector. Explain the role of a magnetic field in a particle detector. So what's going on here is that a magnetic field uh, will show up charged particles by making them curve. Remember that a charged particle is like a current and when it goes through a magnetic field it will feel a force at right angles to its motion and so we can identify from things like the curvature uh, what kind of uh, amount of momentum a particle has and uh, by the direction of curvature we can uh, determine whether it's a positive or a negative particle so it helps us to uh, investigate what's happening with charged particles by looking at their curvature we can deduce things like their momentum 
and other properties like the sign of their charge. Explain how you can tell the track XY was produced by a particle moving from X to Y rather than Y to X. So X to Y rather than Y to X. Well, what we're noticing here is that the curvature is increasing. It's spiraling in from X to Y. So this is a more gentle curve getting tighter. And the curvature relates to momentum. A tighter curve is a lower momentum and a gentle curve is a higher momentum. So this is losing momentum, which is what we would expect if it was traveling this way. We wouldn't expect a particle to be gaining momentum as it traveled through the detector. That would make no sense. It would break the law of conservation of energy for a start. So this particle is losing energy. Okay. And that means it must be coming this way. So it all comes down to explaining that the region of tighter curvature is the lower momentum. So it must be the end of its motion at y rather than going the other way where, where its motion would be increasing, which wouldn't make any sense. So you need to relate the curvature to the momentum, tight curve, low momentum. So we know that the lower momentum is at y and therefore it's losing energy, so it must be heading that way. The particle that produced track XY was a pi plus, deduce the direction of the magnetic field in the photograph. So we've got a particle that's curving like this in a magnetic field. And we also know that it's a positive particle. So a positive particle, because they're saying it's positive here, this is a bit like current. So this is like knowing the value of I, if this was like a, a charge flowing in a wire. So we can use uh, Fleming's left-hand rule. Uh, we know the force on it must be this way. And we know the current. And what we have to do is use the left-hand rule to work out the direction of B, the magnetic field. So we need to point our thumb in the direction of the black arrow. This is left-hand rule. And our current finger in the direction of I. And when I do that with my left hand, with my thumb pointing to the left and my second finger pointing towards me, I get my first finger, which is field, pointing straight towards out of the page. So that must mean that the field is coming out of the page. So you establish what's going on with the current and the force, and then you use your left hand rule to deduce the magnetic field and it's coming out of the page. Okay. Part D. Why the pi plus decayed into a positively charged muon and a muon neutrino? The mu plus has a very short range before decaying into various particles including a positron which produced the final spiral. Give two reasons why you can deduce that the muon neutrino is neutral. Well, the most obvious reason is that it, it cannot leave a track. Only a charged particle can leave a track by causing ionization. Um, because it doesn't leave a track, there's only one particle at the end. Um, the neutrino doesn't leave a track, therefore it's an uncharged particle. The other reason is that we have a plus decaying to a plus. So it starts as a plus, it decays to another plus. And then that decays to a positron, which is another plus. So we can't have any other uh, charged particles present because the interaction wouldn't conserve charge if that was the case. Okay, we've got one plus, one plus, and the positron represents one plus. So it can't make any other charged particles or the interaction wouldn't conserve charge anymore. Explain the evidence from the photograph for the production of the muon neutrino at y. So what we're meant to notice here is in this, this final decay, there's an abrupt change of direction. And that can only happen because some particle flew off in another direction. 
So if the the um, positron does this kind of thing, kinks off and, and goes like that, it must be because something else was flung off in the other direction. So that's really what you're trying to explain here. There's an abrupt change of direction. That means that there must have been a momentum transferred to the positron, which means something else must be carrying off momentum in another direction. So there must be some other particle present here that we can't see in the detector. Question 15. A vinyl disc is used to store music. Ah, the old days. When the disc is played, a stylus, brackets needle, moves along in a groove in the disc. The disc rotates and bumps in the groove cause the stylus to vibrate. The stylus is attached to a small magnet which is near a coil of wire. When the stylus vibrates there is a potential difference across the terminals of the coil. Explain the origin of this potential difference. So if you wiggle a, a magnet near a coil you get um, electricity produced, you get an EMF and that's what's being picked up in the stylus here, the moving magnet stylus. So the needle wiggles, this magnet wiggles, this coil then produces uh, an EMF through electromagnetic induction. So the vibration here of this magnet causes a change in the flux linkage in this coil and that always produces an EMF according to Faraday's law. So it's an induced EMF caused by a change in flux linkage in the coil when the magnet is caused to move relative to that coil. 15b. The potential difference is then amplified and sent to a loudspeaker. Long playing vinyl discs, LPs, have to be rotated at 33 RPM revolutions per minute so that the encoded bumps in the groove lead to the correct sound frequencies. So obviously if, you, if it goes too fast, the frequencies are too high and it sounds all speeded up, obviously. So it has to rotate at 33, actually 33 and a third, but they've rounded it up to 33. Calculate the angular velocity of an LP. Okay, so omega is an angle divided by time. So this is like an angular speed is angle covered divided by time taken. And the top line needs to be in radians. So we've got 33 times 1 revolution, which is 2 pi. And that takes a minute, which is 60 seconds. And that works out to be roughly 3.5 radians per second. Part 2. As the stylus moves towards the centre of the LP, the encoded bumps must be fitted into a shorter length of groove. Explain why the encoding of bumps in the groove becomes more compressed as the stylus moves towards the centre. Okay, so what we're trying to recognise here is that the linear velocity at a greater distance out near the edge of the record is going to be higher than the linear velocity closer in to the centre of the record because the all points on the record have the same angular velocity. So because V equals R omega and omega is the same for all points on the record they all go round 33 times per minute then V is proportional to R in this case so small values of R, in other words close to the middle of the record the velocity, linear velocity will be lower. So you've got a lower linear velocity near the centre. And that means that in order to produce the same frequencies, the bumps need to be closer together than they do at the side. So because of this lower speed, as the groove comes past the record near the centre, you have to put the bumps closer together to make the same vibration frequencies and therefore sound frequencies. Question 16. The diagram shows a circuit that includes a capacitor. Explain what happens to the capacitor when the switch is closed. So we've got a source of resistance and we've got a source of 
charging voltage here. So when we close this switch, what happens is that we've got a plus side here. So electrons are brought off this plate and at the same time electrons are deposited onto this plate. So we end up with this left hand plate becoming positive and the right hand plate becoming negative and the capacitor will end up with a voltage across it which is the same as the voltage of the cell. Okay, so the potential difference or PD across the resistor rises to a maximum as the switch is closed. Explain why this PD subsequently decreases to zero. Okay, so what happens here is that as charge builds up on the capacitor, it provides a, an opposing voltage. So you've got then two voltages pushing against each other, and so as the capacitor voltage builds up, the current goes down because the net voltage driving current around the circuit is decreasing the whole time. And eventually the two uh, potentials, the potential differences of the two objects become equal and opposite and so at that point the net pushing voltage sending current around the circuit is zero and so the current um, eventually drops to zero and therefore the potential difference across the resistor because there's no current falls to zero. So the size of the current is what's causing there to be a potential difference across the resistor and so as the current decreases, so does that potential difference. So by the time the capacitor is completely charged, the voltages are pushing equal and opposite. And so you get no current at that point, and therefore you get no PD across the resistor. Part B, one type of microphone uses a capacitor. The capacitor consists of a flexible front plate, the diaphragm, and a fixed back plate. The output signal is the potential difference across the resistor. It says here that sound waves cause the flexible front plate to vibrate and change the capacitance. So that's how this works. The capacitance is changed by the vibrations coming in. Moving the plate closer increases the capacitance and moving the plates further out decreases the capacitance. So you've got the value of C changing as these vibrations come in. Explain how the sound wave produces an alternating output signal. So Q equals CV. So if we assume there's a set amount of charge stored here, then the voltage will be Q over C. So when the capacitance increases, as the plates move closer, we would expect V to go down. And as the capacitance decreases, we would expect V to go up. And so we get an alternating value. As the vibrations come in and the capacitance goes up and down, we will get the value of voltage going up and down. And that's where they get their output signal from. So when the voltage here goes down, that will cause current to flow one way through this resistor and when the voltage here goes up it will cause current to flow the other way through that resistor and so the reversal of current direction through this resistor is what's generating a reversing output signal. So in one case it will go up in the other case it will go down so as a vibration comes in we would expect the output signal to be uh, one voltage when the current was flowing one way and another voltage when the current was flowing the other way and so we get a reversing signal so it gives you an AC output. Part C, a microphone has a capacitor of capacitance 500 picofarads and a resistor of resistance 10 mega ohms. Explain why these values are suitable even for sounds of the lowest audible frequency of about 20 hertz. So what you want to do is look at the time constant relating to these values. So the rate at which the capacitor can pass current out of itself or into itself will be based on the value of the time constant RC. So if we multiply those values together we get a time for RC of point, point oh oh 0.005 of a second. 
Now the sound frequencies at the lowest audible value of 20 hertz here is going to relate to this period for the capacitor to fall to like 37% because that's what RC gives us. So the period of the sound will be equal to 1 over F which is 1 over 20 and that works out to be 0.05 of a second so the frequencies at the lowest level are still much slower than the frequency that the capacitor reacts at. Question 17. Antihydrogen atoms have been created at CERN. An antihydrogen atom consists of an antiproton and a positron. Compare the properties of antihydrogen atom with the hydrogen atom. Okay, so you've got an antiproton and a positron compared to a proton and an electron. So you've got the two antiparticles of the proton and the electron. So in normal hydrogen, you've got a proton with an electron running around the outside, and in the antihydrogen, You've got an antiproton, which is a negative particle in the middle, with a positive particle racing around the outside of it. So, because uh, the particles on one side are the antiparticles of the other, the masses are going to be identical, but the charge behaviours are going to be all opposites. Part B, calculate the electrostatic force of attraction between the positron and the antiproton. Assume that the radius of the antihydrogen is 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11. So we've got a Coulomb's law calculation here for the force. And you remember it's like force is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 over r squared. So you're just filling that equation in. And when you fill that in you get 8.2 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons. Part C. Scientists want to find out if antihydrogen atoms emit the same spectra as hydrogen atoms. Antiprotons are relatively easy to contain, however it is very difficult to contain antihydrogen atoms for any period of time. Explain why it is difficult to contain antihydrogen atoms compared with antiprotons. Okay, so how they contain antiprotons is by you know, running them around in a magnetic field. And that's okay because they're a charged particle. But once you put them with the positron, the whole atom becomes a neutral object which can't be sent round in a magnetic field anymore. So it becomes impossible to contain the antihydrogen because it doesn't have an overall charge anymore and it can't be then held using electric magnetic fields. So that's why you can't contain them. Part D, the technology suggested in the science fiction series Star Trek for powering the Starship Enterprise relied on antimatter. When antihydrogen atom meets a hydrogen atom, they annihilate and produce energy. How much energy in joules would be produced by the annihilation of just one milligram of antihydrogen atoms? Now this is a little bit fiddly because um, when we have the these particles sorry it's a negative um, you have to have equal amounts of normal matter and antimatter so if you're annihilating a milligram of antihydrogen you have to have also a milligram of the other stuff so there's a total of two milligrams here in order to get this to happen and so the energy produced will just be um, uh, c squared. So 2 milligrams is going to be 2 times 10 to the minus 6 of a kilogram. And you multiply that by c squared then to get the energy in joules. And that gives us a value of 1.8 times 10 to the 11 joules. 
D part 2 then, antiprotons are required to produce antihydrogen atoms. The total production of antiprotons on Earth over the past 25 years adds up to only a few nanograms. Suggest why so little antimatter has been created. So the idea here is that you have to go to very high energies to produce antimatter um, in accelerators or whatever. So basically we have produced very little of them, even in all the particle accelerator collisions that have happened. We have produced only handfuls of particles, you know, not significant amounts. It takes a very large number of particles to create any significant amount of mass. So even though we've been producing them in accelerators for ages, we're not producing significant amounts of them because of the high energy needed to produce antimatter. They're only happening in accelerators. Um, so we don't see very much of them. Question 18. James Chadwick is credited with the discovering of the neutron in 1932. Beryllium was bombarded with alpha particles, knocking neutrons out of the beryllium. And Chadwick placed various targets between the beryllium and a detector. And hydrogen and nitrogen atoms were then knocked out of targets by the neutrons. And the kinetic energies of these atoms were measured by the detector. So this is what happened. Uh, Chadwick was um, convinced that there was a neutral particle coming out. This was found by putting other particles in the way, or other objects in the way, and then the, the neutrons were knocking stuff out. And by looking at the, the particles that they could detect, they couldn't detect the neutron, but they could detect the particles it was knocking out, and looking at the energies of those really is what was going on in that experiment. So it's important to recognize that this value is the kinetic energy. So it's the value of a half m v squared, although it is in um, mega electron volts at the minute. This thing here represents the v that is present here. And this is obviously the m. So the kinetic energy is equal to half mv squared, but we need this to be in joules. So the velocity is going to be uh, the root of 2 times the kinetic energy over m. So the top line is 2 times the kinetic energy with the conversion to joules. And the bottom line is 14 of these um, u's. So 14 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27. So we multiply that out, we get, and take the square root. And I get 4064878 meters per second for that, which is what they asked us to find, 4 million meters per second. Part B, the mass of the neutron is NU, where N is the relative mass of the neutron, and its initial velocity is then x. The nitrogen atom is 14u. Um, it's initially stationary and is then knocked out of the target with a velocity y by collision with the neutron. Show that the velocity z of the neutron after the collision can be written as this. Now this looks horrendous but what you're doing here is a conservation of momentum calculation. So you put the mass times the velocity of the neutron coming in and you put it equal to the uh, mass times the velocity of what's going out, all the things that are going out, and the sum of all those momentums on the way in equals the momentum on the way out. Okay, so before we only have one object moving. It has a mass first object mass times first object's initial velocity, after the first object has a new velocity, and the second object has a velocity. So, we're told all the properties. The first one's mass of the neutron coming in is n times uh, u, and its velocity is x. So this is its momentum. It 
still has the same mass after, but it has a new velocity z after the collision. And the mass of the uh, nitrogen atom is 14u, and its velocity is y. So momentum coming in, momentum of the neutron going out, momentum of the nitrogen atom going out. And all we're doing is rearranging this to get z on its own, because they want the velocity z of the neutron after the collision. So that's this thing. We want to get this on its own. So we divide out u for a start. And we get the nx equals nz plus 14y. And then nz on its own is nx minus 14y. And z on its own is nx minus 14y divided by n. And that's it. Question 18b, part 2. The collision between this neutron and the nitrogen atom is elastic. What is meant by an elastic collision? And this is just a standard from your book answer. Elastic collisions are collisions where kinetic energy is conserved. So they then ask, explain uh, why the kinetic energy EK of the nitrogen atom is given by this. Now these are all properties of the neutron. Okay, so there's a half here. Remember that kinetic energy is a half mv squared. This is the mass of the neutron, and these are the velocities. So this expression represents the change of kinetic energy, the loss of kinetic energy of the neutron. And if elastic collisions have conserved kinetic energy, then the loss of energy of the neutron must be the gained energy of the nitrogen atom. And since it didn't have any energy at the beginning, the nitrogen atom, anything it gained, will be its final kinetic energy. So the, this is the loss of energy of the neutron, so it must be the energy gained by the nitrogen. That's what's going on here. Part C. The two equations in B can be combined and Z can be eliminated to give this value of Y equals 2NX over N plus 14. The maximum velocity of the hydrogen atom is knocked out by the neutrons in the same experiment was 30 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. The mass of the hydrogen atom is 1U. Show that the relative mass N of the neutron is 1. So we write this equation out for both cases. In one case where we're knocking out uh, nitrogen and the other case where we're knocking out hydrogen. So y for nitrogen is going to be 2nx over n plus 14, the 14 corresponding to the nitrogen. And uh, for hydrogen it's going to correspond to 2nx over n plus 1 for the hydrogen. Um, and so 2nx appears here both times. So the 2nx will equal y for the nitrogen times this and 2nx will equal y for the hydrogen times this. <clears throat> and that's okay until you look at the Mark scheme and you realize you can put these two things equal to each other. But the Mark scheme then introduces this 3.0 times 10 to the 7 and it appears that this only works out to give you an n of roughly 1 if you've got that. Now that doesn't correspond to the value here. So we've got 30 times 10 to the 7 here and down here we're introducing 3.0 times 10 to the 7. So you're meant to solve this for n but it only appears to work if you've got 3.0 um, down here. Part 2. This equation cannot be applied to all collisions in this experiment suggest why. So the Mark scheme at this point suggests things like the collision not being elastic or possibly relativistic effects like uh, mass changing. So anything sensible I would imagine here would get you the mark. And that's it. All done.